everybody, Will Alexander from Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips, brought to you by Canine Chronicle TV. This week in the interview chair we have Mr. Wood Warnell. It was an excellent interview, I can't wait for you all to see it or, or listen to it if you're on the podcast, uh, but sit back and relax and listen to Wood. Hi everybody, today we have a special guest. We have Mr. Wood Warnell. How are you, Wood? I couldn't be better. Will, how are you doing? I'm doing great. You look fabulous. Thank you. Thank you very much. How's, uh, how's the pandemic been treating you? It's, um, knock on wood, you know, uh, both Barb and I are healthy. Um, we live in a small town and uh, we kind of limit ourselves. We don't go out very often. Uh, we wish that we were being involved in uh, dog show, dog people events more often, but uh, not really. We haven't been able to do that very much. Yeah. But uh, other than secluding ourselves and trying to do the right thing, uh, it's going fine. Well, that's good. Glad, happy to hear that. Okay, I'm going to jump right into it. Wood. Tell me how you first got involved in dogs. Um, I first got involved in dogs because as a youngster, I was not allowed to have dogs. My sister was extremely allergic to dogs. And whether that was the real reason or my parents just didn't want to be bothered by the responsibility of taking care of a dog of mine, I could never have a dog. So when I got to be old enough, uh, I got a job uh, at a kennel in Kansas City. I grew up in Kansas City. And I went to work for an old dog handler named D. Anderson. And D. Anderson showed a lot of working dogs. He was a great buddy of Rex Vandevender and, uh, you know, uh, Larry and, and Jack Funk and all those guys. And uh, every weekend he'd pack his truck up with boxers and collies and Great Danes and off to dog shows he went. And um, so I worked at his kennel and I picked up poop and I uh, shaved the feet of poodles that were there for pet trimming. And uh, that was my introduction to it. And this fella came in, uh, actually a Canadian uh, born guy, his name was Gary Clark and he had Airedales. And um, my grandfather, who I never knew, he had Airedales and he imported Airedales from England uh, for his own personal use. And this guy came in and he had Airedales, I would talk to him about dog shows, and I would go over to his house and look at his Airedales, he showed them, and, and finish their championships. And while all this was going on, um, I got to know Mel Schlesinger. And Mel Schlesinger was from the great Kerry Blue Kennel, yeah. Melby's, Melby. and uh, he bred Chances Are. And I would talk to Mel and I said, Mel, I'd like to get involved in showing terriers and especially Airedales, but showing terriers. Not to cut you off, how old were you at that point, Wood? Oh my gosh, uh, I was about 16 years old, Will. And um, uh, Mel's handler was Rick Chishudian. And so Mel said that he would contact Rick for me. And uh, he did. And Rick said that yes, that uh, he would be interested in having me come to work for him. Um, that was quite a lot for a kid from Kansas City who had never left Kansas City, <laughs> going all the way to Los Angeles, but I was more than willing to do it. Unfortunately, my father, uh, who was an old Kansas City banker, conservative old Kansas City banker, said that I had to complete my high school education before I could go there. So when I graduated, then I went out to California to start my work with Rick. Wow. And, and, and how long were you with Rick then? Uh, uh, well, I worked for him for seven and a half years. Uh, the first uh, three and a half were summer times that uh, were the breaks in college. I went to SMU in Dallas. And uh, so on my summer breaks, I'd go out to California to work for Rick. Uh, after I graduated, uh, I made uh, a deal with my father, 
said that I would graduate from college and then after that, that uh, uh, I would like to go to work in California for this man. And uh, he wasn't real happy about it, but uh, he agreed. So at that point, I went to work for Rick and I worked for him for four continuous years until I left and went out on my own. And uh, tell, tell me something about your times with Rick. There must, there's gotta be some good stories in there. Oh my God. Uh, this entire interview and a heck of a lot beyond that uh, would, be, would be dealing with working with Rick. Um, Rick was, um, he was extremely passionate about dogs. And you could say what you wanted to about Rick and it would, everything that you said would probably be true. And not, no one knew him better than I did. Um, but his passion for terriers and his passion for dogs was amazing. And as somebody like myself, who was a sponge, um, it was a nonstop learning experience. And it was like going to college and then some. And some of my best times, Will, as yours <coughs> were, spent driving up <clears throat> I-5, sitting in the front of his truck and listening to his dog stories about great old dog men, uh, like Ben Brown, who Rick worked for, and uh, the Sangster Brothers, and uh, young Corky Vroom, and all the great dog men in California. And then we'd go to these dog shows, Will, and so let's say, for instance, we'd be on the Calor circuit and there were five shows in five days. And the first show might, the first group might be the Terrier group and he'd win the Terrier group and he'd sit there in his lawn chair and he'd sit there while the groups were going on. And if everything back at the setup was well organized, I would go and sit on the ground next to him. And he would talk to me about the various group winners that he would be competing against for best in show. And Will, these were never like, oh, that Greyhound of Corky's is, uh, or, the, or the Doberman of Corky's was a piece of garbage. He would never do that. He would tell me what were the great things about that Doberman? What were the great things about Joe Waterman's Min Pins? What were the great things about Frank Sabella's Standard Poodles? And those were my first educational opportunities on learning about dogs outside of the Terrier group. And um, one of my greatest times was spent with a man named Ben Brown, who only the oldest people watching this will know who Ben was. And Ben was Rick's mentor. And after I would be done working for Rick, my 12, 14 hour days, I'd go over to Ben's apartment and he and Jeannie had an apartment in North Hollywood and I would sit down on the floor again by his chair and he would talk to me about dogs and I have his whole collection of old dog photos. And this is a man who won the first group in the United States on an English Springer Spaniel. He won the first group in the United States on a Kerry Blue Terrier. And I mean, the knowledge that Ben had, uh, you just can't imagine. And he would talk dogs to me. And so these were my early opportunities to learn about dogs. That's amazing. I'd love to sit and hear all those stories. Absolutely. <laughs> the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. What do they say? I'd love to hear <laughs> them all, for sure. It's, it's all educational. That's amazing. Yeah. So you worked for Rick for four straight years, seven and a half entirely. Right. Um, on your own, tell me what, what made you decide to go on your own? Did well, Rick give you his blessings or how did, how did it go? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're asking good ones. Well, you're asking really good ones. First of all, in the, in the months that I wasn't working for Rick and I was going to SMU, I was missing dog shows so badly that I helped Dorley Wilson out at the dog shows. I helped Mike Kemp out at the dog shows while college was going on. But when I left Rick, it was not on good terms. Some people like Jamie and Bob, if you worked for Jamie and Bob, 
uh, they were very supportive of the people that worked for them. Uh, other handlers were very supportive. I, I would have to think that the people uh, that Mike and Lynn Pitts, you know, that having uh, worked uh, for the people they worked for were very, very supportive. Um, Rick was not so much that way. And at the time that I had, was working for Rick, he was getting towards uh, the end and he was losing a bit of his enthusiasm. And he was getting very involved in the sculptures. And so the majority of his time would be spent on the sculptures. And I was in the kennel doing the lion's share of the work. And one of the fortunate things for me was I got to do a lot of the finish work on Red Baron that Rick would normally do himself. So when I would be done uh, trimming a dog, I would take it into the house on a lead and I'd uh, show Rick all four sides of the dogs and he would go, all right, kid, take a little bit off of there. All right, kid, take a little bit off of there. <laughs> and that was his stamp of approval of what I was doing. When I left, we weren't on great terms. And um, I had to, I, I had to battle Rick a little bit, uh, no, more than a little bit, when I went on, on my own. Uh, but it wasn't that long thereafter that he and his wife, Sandy, moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and that enabled me not to have to deal with him on a weekend, week out basis. Okay. I wish the parting had been better. Oh, sure, yes. So, so you're on your own. Where did you go from there? What did, how did it start? What dogs did you start with? Um, I was really fortunate, Will, uh, the dogs that I started out with I, and the clients that I started out with. And some of these clients were clients of Rick's that possibly Rick wasn't giving first call to or they felt that Rick wasn't doing a good enough job for them. So because they knew me, from the day in and day out work at the kennel, when I left, they came to me. And one of the clients would, was um, uh, Lil Schwartz. Uh, Mrs. Schwartz came to me and I showed uh, Welsh Terriers for her. And then a great client that I had off, right off the bat was uh, Linda Honey and her mother, Marion Honey, who had the Rockledge Irish Terrier Kennel, which in my estimation is the greatest, most influential kennel of Irish Terriers of all time. And why Linda has not been nominated for Breeder of the Year, uh, I don't know, because this is a woman who in a breed that never won anything has gone best in show on eight Irish Terriers, different ones that I know of. And uh, so I was very fortunate to have those two clients and then a, a splattering of other clients uh, that came along with me. And um, uh, so that's when uh, uh, I, I met my first wife and we got married and we had a family. I ended up getting a phenomenal kennel. Uh, I got the old Marienburg uh, Doberman kennel. Mm -hmm which at the time was the Starcrest Chow Chow Kennel. Marion Berg sold it to Joel Marston of Starcrest. Joel Marston said it, uh, sold it to me. So I was able to start out with beyond a fantastic kennel loaded with history. I'm sure, wow. And how long were you there? Uh, I was there, um, I was there for about 15 years, a little over 15 years, and then I moved up to the San Ynez Valley, which is about 30 minutes north of Santa Barbara, and um, just the most beautiful place in the world, filled with uh, uh, grapevines, orchards, horse farms, I mean, just beautiful. And um, I was questionable as to whether or not any of my Los Angeles-based clientele would follow me up there. I didn't know how much uh, San Ynez-based business I would pick up. So two examples, one was small term, one was huge. The small term one was one day I got a call from a lady 
that had Anatolian shepherds. And she said, uh, Mr. Warnall, would you be interested in showing an Anatolian for me? And I was hungry at the time, Will, and I said, sure, uh, bring it over and I'll look at it and evaluate it. I hung up the phone and I said, what the hell are they supposed to look like? <laughs> so I picked up the phone and I called Corky and Sue Broom and I got Sue and Sue said, Woody, it's really easy. When they drive up the driveway, the door to the car opens and they open the crate door and the dog comes out. If it doesn't eat you, it's show quality. <laughs> and Corky was showing a best in show winner at the time. I finished this bitch in four shows with three five point majors, one of which was a breed over Corky's best in show winner. And then the other client, which uh, is just, just an amazing human being, an amazing client, and has gone on to be so supportive with Jenny, is a lady named Alex Jeremia. And Alex Jeremia is the lady who owns the French Bulldogs and the lady who has backed the corgis of Bill Shelton. And this lady is, first of all, a lady, and uh, she loves the sport of dogs, and uh, she was huge for me and is huge for my daughter Jenny now. That's great. So you've mentioned a few people, but do you have others that you consider mentors of yours? Well, I, there are three men in my life that I consider the three most influential men in my life. Uh, the first was Rick Chishudian. He was my teacher. He was, uh, um, he taught me pretty much everything that I know. Um, the second uh, was a man in England named Herbert Atkinson. And Herbert Atkinson was a, a very famous Lakeland breeder. His prefix was Wyndham. And Herbert uh, became a private handler for Mrs. Nell Ernstrom, uh, who was in California but lived primarily in Belgium and had great terriers. Herbert was a great terrier man, a great terrier man. He had an eye for terriers. He was more than willing to impart his wisdom on me. And as my career started off and kept going, many of the top winning dogs that I imported from Europe were dogs that Herbert had found for me. How did you and meet then, Herbert? Pardon me? How did you meet Herbert? Herbert came over to uh, the United States and when he was working for Mrs. Ermston, he was in California and he was showing dogs in California. And he was very personable. I mean, when you met him, uh, you were fortunate and he became your best friend. And I met him at the shows there. And then when I would go to England, I would stay with Herbert and his wife, Peggy, at the, Ken at, his name was Ken Ross House. And it was, um, oh, the name is escaping me where it was located, but it's not far from where Jeff Korish and Michael Coe live now. And I would stay with them and Herbert would take me all over England and he would take me to Holland and to Belgium where we looked at a lot of dogs. Uh, I, and he died, he died way too young. And um, I blame it on socialized medicine in England. Uh, I wish that he would have had medical, better medical care, but he passed away at a young age and I miss him to this day. The third most influential uh, person is somebody that you know well, and that's Bobby Fisher. And Bobby Fisher is one of the great dogmen of all time. His personality maybe didn't uh, endear him to everyone, but if he loved you, which he did me, um, it was like no love that you felt. And when he became a judge, Will, I thought he could become the greatest judge of all time in America or anywhere. Unfortunately, it wasn't for him, and he decided to retire from that. But my friendship with Bobby and staying at my manor in Baltimore when he was married to Susan and the people that I met through Bobby, both here in the United States but also overseas, um, 
helped me get going in my career. So those three men were, uh, were my beginnings, truly my beginnings in dogs. So did you meet, I guess you met Bob at shows though when you were in the East? Or? Bobby used to come out to California and he would show dogs at Beverly Hills or he would show dogs at Great Western or show dogs at Santa Barbara. And he would always stay at Rick's Kennel. And so I got to know him by staying at Rick's Kennel. And a lot of times he brought this fella named Billy Thompson with him. And I don't know, you're not shaking your head, so I don't know whether you know Billy, but Billy uh, was a great Airedale handler. And of course, starting in Airedales, uh, I loved Billy. And Billy showed a dog called Jokel Superman and Harbor Hills Clark Kent and some of the great Airedales of all time. So immediately I was endeared to Billy. And Billy was a character. He, he Anybody who knew him, he was a character. But uh, he and Bobby would come out and stay at the kennel. And, and that's how I got to know uh, Bobby. So that's a lot so far there, Wood. Tell me, you've shown lots of dogs. Do you have any favorites that come to mind right away? Yes, yes. And uh, I, I think that this might surprise people because this dog is not one of my top winning dogs of all time, but it's a dog that I credit changing the face of a breed. And that is an Irish Terrier dog called Rock Ledge's Mick Michael. And prior to Michael, the most number of best in shows that had ever been won by an Irish Terrier was a bitch that Ellsworth Gamble showed named Slemish Superb. Michael ended up winning 13 best in shows, which in today's day and age doesn't seem like a lot. But for a breed that most judges just passed by when they walked down the line of the Terrier group, for this dog to have won the number of groups and best in shows that he did is a testimonial to what a great dog he was. He in turn sired the dog um, that Bobby Fisher did all the winning with. And that dog in turn, and that dog doubled uh, Michael's record and his name was Rowdy Red. That dog won 26 best in shows. Then Rowdy sired a dog <coughs> that R.C. Carusi showed. And I want to say that R.C.'s dog doubled the record that Rowdy won. And to this day, Michael has sired more best in show winning Irish Terriers, more national specialty winners, more group winners <coughs> than any Irish Terrier. He changed the look and the competitiveness of Irish Terriers. So I put him at the head of the list. I loved the Welsh Terrier dog, uh, Billy the Kid, that I showed for Bruce and Lil. I loved uh, the Wire Fox Terrier bitch named Dynamic Super Sensation <coughs> that Herbert found for me and I went best in show at Montgomery County with. Um, there were a lot of dogs that I showed that I really loved, uh, but those three sit at the top of the list for me. Um, one of the greatest dogs, let me have a, a drink of water real Good quick. Question. One of the greatest dogs that I was fortunate enough to be involved with and involved in his breeding was the Airedale dog that Jenny showed, um, Ever May's High Performance. And that dog, that dog was a dog that, that I was somewhat instrumental in creating the breeding that created the dog. I thought that was a great dog. Um, I was able uh, to show him one weekend because Jenny was sick that weekend. So um, I ended up going second in the group the first night under Elliot Weiss. I was mortified. And then the <laughs> second night, Elliot did best in show. I won the group and he gave the dog best in show. So I was somewhat uh, relieved about that. But uh, I thought that that dog was truly a great dog. So you've had, you've had all these good dogs and then you've been in touch with these good dogs. Are there dogs out there that you wished you'd been involved with? Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think my favorite dog of all time was the Kerry Blue dog that Bill McFadden showed. 
uh, Scarf Michael. Um, he took my breath away. And um, uh, Bill is a much better trim of a, trimmer of Kerry Blues than I was. So the dog uh, was shown by the right person. <laughs> and Bill did a great job with that dog. I loved the Wire Fox Terrier dog that uh, Peter Green showed, spot on, Sunnybrook spot on. I loved that dog. Controversial dog, too big, but spectacular. Um, I loved the Wire Fox Terrier bitch that Gabriel showed, uh, the ginger bitch, Sky. I thought she was fantastic. Um, there, were, there were lots of dogs uh, that I, I admired a lot. I, I also want to say that I was fortunate enough to show dogs outside of the terrier group. Um, the beagle that I showed, Little Big Man, um, I loved that dog. Absolutely. He was a character. He, 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 he was, he was <coughs> a dog that you, you know, I enjoyed watching and following along. You know. mm -hmm. He was, oh my goodness, he was the epitome of a show dog. I mean, I could show that dog like Stan Flowers used to show that Weimar on her bitch, Rhea. I, you know, I could just stroke the tail and back away and he'd freeze it. It was amazing. But uh, I love that dog. And uh, I get into little arguments with my fiance, Barbara, because initially in the beginning, she was involved with that 13 inch bitch Liberty Bell that was shown about the same time. So we go back and forth as to who was the better <laughs> beagle. <laughs> That's fair. <Yeah. laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. So what about, so you have all these dogs you, you, you touched on. What is your favorite breed, Wood? Do you have a favorite breed? I do. I do. Um, my, my passion is Airedales. I really, that's the breed I started in. And it's such a difficult breed, Will. You have to love that breed if you are willing to put up with the hours that it takes to trim them. And Rick always used to say, if you can trim an Airedale, you can trim anything. So a lot of people will argue with me on that point. And a lot of standard poodle people will say, oh, they're, they're as difficult if not more. I always say, you can take a poodle that's been in the back of a kennel for six months, and if it's not all felted to the skin, you can brush it out and you can trim it and you can show it the next day. You can't do that with an Airedale. Yeah. You know, you've got to strip them down 12 months ahead of time. You have to keep up with a weekly schedule. Uh, when you do get them in coat, the time it takes you to trim the flat work and the throat and the cheeks and, and everything to do it properly, not by taking shortcuts like I've done now a lot of days. To do an Airedale is more difficult than any breed. So to do it and to do it right, and each week to put three or four hours on doing a show trim on an Airedale, you truly have to love them. Wait, just sheer acreage alone. You know, exactly. I, so yes. much work. I, I, I showed some Airedales, but not like you did. And it was just, it was so much work because I showed a lot of sporting dogs as well. And then to fit those dogs into the schedule to trim, I just couldn't do them justice like you, you could. So I was a sporting well, dog. Well, so. I, I want to say something about you. And, and I want to compare <laughs> you to George Alston, who I believe you worked for. Well, he, he, um, he's, my, he's my hero. <laughs> okay. George Alston and you did it right with the gun dogs. You did it finger and thumb. You didn't do it with a lion's share of thinning shears and clippers and shortcuts. And I'll never forget whether this was the best one of all time. I don't know. But I'll never forget George with that Irish setter marquee took my breath away yeah. and to see you with some of those Irish setters that you showed and the Gordons and the Springers, the same thing will, and that's where my admiration for you has come into play. And also I'm a believer in handing it down. And I'm very fortunate to have had some very talented people work for me. You had Adam Bernardin work for you. And to see the job that Adam has done on his gun dogs, 
keeps in mind you and then George Alston. You have handed it down. And I can only hope and pray that Adam hands it down to somebody. I'm sure he will. That dog, Marquis, he was my favorite Irish sitter of all time. That dog right there is his nephew, or his, 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 yeah, his nephew. And that's his great, great grandson over there. So oh. those are dogs I got to show. So <laughs> That makes me so happy that you say that because I have many memories of great dogs. I have memories. There was an Alaskan Malamute named Talek that Marna Pearson showed, took my breath away. But there was an example that Rick used to say, and, and Marna, God rest your soul, but Rick would always say, anybody can luck into one dog. Anybody can luck into one dog. The great dog man is like you and George Alston and Rick, who would the minute, or not even the minute you were done with the dog, halfway through the career of a dog, you'd already decided on your next one. You know, well, you know, Marna had that dog. I don't know that she ever had another one after that. But uh, I remember uh, that dog. And, and um, um, damn it, something, I'm getting old. I'm getting forgetful and stuff. <laughs> but uh, uh, so many, oh, uh, the German short hair pointer that Joe Schellenbarger showed, oh, yeah. uh, Columbia River. I remember that, but you know, Gretchen and I used to get into little arguments about whether or not that was a great one or not. I mean, she certainly knew more about the breed than I did, but I thought he was a great one from my memory. And uh, those are things and dogs like that and great dog people like that, that I remember. Joe Waterman with Impossible Dream and, and Frankie with Command Performance, the standard poodle. Yeah. Um, those, are the, those are memories that I have. Incredible times. Yes. Wow. So you, you touched on your uh, your apprentices. Can you, you can you? I don't want to leave anybody out, but there must be a few that stick in your head with some good stories about. Do you have any stories of, of some of your young apprentices that that came Absolutely. up Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you just nailed it. Your last sentence is a sentence that I hope young people heard you say and will listen to what I have now to say. So many of our new handlers are these kids that put on a nice suit, get a nice haircut, and walk into the ring, the dog is handed to them, and they win. That's not how I did it. That's not how you did it. That's not how Adam did it. That's not how my daughter Jenny did it, and so on and so forth. I'm a huge believer in apprenticeships, huge believer. And that's how you learn about dogs, not just how to trim them, how to feed them, how to care for them. Rick used to say, kid, you've got to learn the ABCs first. You've got to know how to look a dog in his eye and say and, and determine, is that dog well and happy or not? You have to know how to feed them. You have to know how to medicate them. You know how to keep them warm or keep them cool and watered. After you know all that basic, then you can learn how to trim them and then you can learn how to show them. So I want to encourage new people to locate great handlers that are currently showing dogs today and go to them and beg, borrow, steal an apprenticeship. Do it for free, do it for I don't care what. Don't worry about how much you're getting paid. Don't worry about how long the hours are. That's how you're gonna learn and that's how you're gonna become great. I was very lucky to be able to recognize people that I thought could go on to have a career and be uh, great handlers. I feel in my heart that the most talented of all of my assistants, and I don't mean to insult others, but was Robert Milano. Robert Milano was the best of the best. He didn't have a great business sense about him. Um, he didn't want to do the basics about learning how to do the billing or learning how to put the entries in or learning how to get to the dog show. But you want to talk about somebody that could pick up trimming, pick up care for the dogs, do a great job showing a dog, Robert Milano. Incredible. Um, um, uh, Andrew Peel, the young man who was my last assistant, uh, he now lives in New York. Andrew. Uh, had such loyalty and longevity with me, a very kind soul, 
put up with a lot from me. Um, I just, I love him a lot. Um, uh, R.C. Carusi worked for me. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't end up on great terms, but an extremely talented individual. Peter Atkinson worked for me. Very talented person, again, didn't end up on the, on the best of terms. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of, of others. Oh, uh, Todd, Clyde, Todd, another one, worked for me for a very long time. Uh, and again, uh, a very kind person. Uh, unfortunately with Todd, the first couple of years I had to spend breaking him of bad habits before I could teach him good habits. That kind of made it a little bit more difficult. Whereas with somebody like Peter Atkinson, who came to work for me, he had no habits. And so I was able to start him off uh, uh, from the ground floor, a little bit easier to teach him that way. Definitely, yes. I find that, that as well, that even training anybody that, the ones that are, like I do a lot of seminars and classes, and the people that have almost zero uh, work or history in dogs are the ones that catch on faster. Oh. No. As long if as they've they got the enthusiasm to. and they're not afraid yeah. of hard work and long hours, they're going to make it. Yeah, I agree. They're going to make it. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give? Like you're, you're judging now. When, when, did you, when did you start judging? When did you retire? What, what year? Um, I retired about five and a half years ago. And it was time for me to retire for a couple of reasons. I had double knee replacement. So I, I, couldn't, I couldn't run with dogs any longer. I couldn't show dogs any longer, other than I had a top winning French Bulldog at the end. That was my last one. And Jenny allowed me to be a star with one dog while she did all the work with all the other dogs. And I remember one day going to, to Montgomery County and um, I, I showed an Airedale and I, I don't know if I, went Winter's Dog with it or something. And I came out the ring and uh, Charlie Foley was standing outside the ring. And uh, Charlie grabbed me as I came out and he goes, uh, Wood, you might want to consider retiring uh, because it looks like you're struggling out there. And then a couple of years later, um, Rhonda Davis was judging the breed in Airedales at Montgomery. And Jenny got tied up in Irish and I took an Airedale bitch in and I won the breed at Montgomery. And as Rhonda was handing me the ribbon, um, I said, see, I've still got it. And she said, Woody, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was time, Will, it was time for me. Uh, and Jenny was there doing all the work, doing the vast majority of the winning. I was getting paid. It wasn't right that I was getting paid and she wasn't. And so it enabled me to say, now's the time. And my father was a banker. He was a Missouri banker. And at the end of a very long career, he walked out the door, they shook his hand and he walked away. And he walked home and he spent the days with mom, 24 hours a day. And he could not use any of the knowledge that he had accrued for all those years as a banker. It was, that was before uh, uh, computers. Mm -hmm. I felt with judging, it was a way for me to use the knowledge that I had worked to gain for 42 years. And I could wake up in the morning and I could feel useful and I could give back. And will I love it? I love judging. And I have pro progressed now into the sporting group. I've got uh, four fifths of the sporting group. I, I think my favorite breed to judge is golden retrievers of all of them. Uh, but that's because my fiance, that's her breed. She bred a uh, huge best in show winner 30 years ago. And every time I come out of the ring, I say, how did I do? But uh, now I've got bulldogs and poodles and cavaliers and, uh, uh, breeds in different groups. And I really, I love it. I love the challenge. Uh, I love how it makes my mind work. And I'm really enjoying the judging. 
Okay. Would um, who would you have as who would you consider your judging mentors? That's a really good question. Um, as far as these, however you call them, webinars, interviews that you're doing, I have to admit I've seen two so far. I've seen the one with Ken Murray, which I thought was fantastic. And I came away with even more respect and, and I, I liked him even more after the interview, I really did. And then Mr. Reynolds. I just, I can't tell you how much I think of Jim Reynolds. I can't tell you. And in the beginning, my, my idol, the, the greatest judge, I thought, was Mrs. Clark. Without, without doubt, the greatest judge was Mrs. Clark. And uh, I remember one lady, uh, I'll name her if you want me to, but she gave me best in show one time, uh, well, Anne-Marie Moore. She gave me best in show at Montgomery County with the wire fox terrier bitch. And she read that I said, Mrs. Clark. And she said, you mean you're not going to say that I'm your favorite judge? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Anne-Marie, I love you. And I think you're a great judge. But, um, and when Mrs. Clark passed away, I would have to say to you that, that Mr. Reynolds, in my estimation, inherited that position. I just, I admire him. I find myself staring at him. Um, I watch him, I learn from him. Um, and he's more than willing to talk to me afterwards. Um, I think that Ed Biven is fantastic. I think that Ed Biven is as honest as the day is long, as is Mr. Reynolds. But I think that Mr. Mr. Biven sometimes narrows in on pieces, just like Mr. Kendrick did when he judged, uh, like the color of a toenail or the size of a, of a nose, you know? And don't get mad at me, you know I love you, but um, I love Mrs. Billings, I love Mrs. Forsythe, um, I love Mr. Forsythe, um, uh, I, I love all of these people, um, and when I was trying to learn how to become a handler, Ben Brown taught me something. And Ben said, you work for Rick and you are an extension of Rick. So when you go into the ring, you have to emulate and copy Rick because you are his extension. But I want you to start to look at other handlers, not necessarily so I started looking at George Sankster. I started looking at Rauer. I started looking at Frank Sabella. I started watching. I started watching people that I thought had great hands showing a dog. And I would see a trick that you did in the ring, or a trick that Richard Bauer did that Rick never taught me. I put it in the back of my mind. And I didn't use it when I was showing for Rick as his assistant, but when I went out on my own, I incorporated those. So pretty soon, I had what became my style, which was an accumulation from a lot of other handlers. I'm trying to do the same thing as a judge. I'm trying to look at people that I think are great judges. I think that Kim Meredith is a great judge. Um, and I'm looking at people like that, the way they judge, the way Mr. Biven goes over a poodle, uh, the way that these people judge different breeds. And I remember those things and I put them in the back of my mind so that when I'm judging, I can start to do those things. That's interesting. When I, I worked for Bobby Stebbins and, and he would do that to me too, whenever I had a break in the schedule, he would look on the schedule and say, okay, go watch Gene show a Saluki. And he'd send me off to go watch Gene show Saluki. Did that constantly. And, that, and it, was a, it was a great learning tool for me. So. God, another great, are you talking about Gene Blake? Yeah. I had a conversation with Gene Blake five days ago because I wanted to know about a specific Afghan. 
And I said, Gene, this is a breed that I, I love and, and I think I can recognize a good one, but I can't say that when I'm in for best in show, judging that, you know, that I'm gonna know all there is to warrant me putting that dog best in show. Oh my God, the lessons that I got on Afghans from that man were, I'll never forget, never forget. So I loved it when you just mentioned that name. And he loves teaching them too, easy. Oh, oh my teacher. goodness, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've gone through mentors. We're gonna we're, and we're gonna sort of uh, carry on with that same theme. If you could have dinner with two or three of these people from the past or that have passed, who would they be and why? I would put so many. Uh, I would put uh, Fisher. I would put Bobby Fisher at the head of the list. I would put Dougie Holloway <laughs> right up there. Yep. If you get Dougie to talk about dogs and old dog men, um, it's it's nonstop. It's never ending. I know. I interviewed um, him not too long ago, and he could have kept going and going. He had story after story. He was fabulous. Story after story, and each one as good as as the next one. Yeah. Um, I would I would love to to talk with Frank Savella. You know, I would love to listen to Frankie's stories. Okay, um, uh, but let's, uh, I, I, like, I enjoy what you said about those three, but tell me which ones that have gone that you would have liked to have dinner with one more. Oh, that have passed away. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Mrs. Clark. Absolutely, Mrs. Clark. Uh, Janie, can you imagine the story? Yeah. Tell and, <laughs> and would tell, yes. Um, uh, Mike Billings. I would love to hear the stories that Mike Billings would have to tell. Um, here's somebody, Norman Austin. Oh, yeah. yeah. Norman Austin. Uh, when I was young and I ended up buying uh, that kennel, that the Starcrest Kennels, uh, we had for dinner one night, Norman Austin, um, um, uh, the chat, Joel Marston was there. Um, Dr. Huggins, Lee Huggins was there. You talk about an interesting conversation. Uh, sure. yeah. <laughs> but the things that Norman Austin could say and talk about, I just wish. Ben Brown, Ben Brown, one of the saddest stories I know, Will, Ben Brown was encouraged and wrote a book on the favorite dog stories that he had from great dog men that were either contemporaries of his or ones in the past. And he compiled this book and Beauchamp found out about the book. Richard Beauchamp found out about the book. He had kennel review at the time. So he said to Ben, let me have the book and I will publish some uh, transcripts from this book to pique people's interest in the book to help its sale. He lost, he lost everything. And all the work that Ben had gone through writing these stories, stories about dog people, dogs, things like that, they were gone. And by that time, Ben was too old. That was very so uh, sad, but Ben would have been another one that would have been fantastic. So the book never got published then? No, never got published. That's a shame, that would have been a great book to have. Yeah, great book. And I just wish more people knew Ben Brown because there are people out there, there are young people out there that might think that they're too short to be great dog handlers or too heavy to be great dog handlers or too this or too that. Ben was short and fat. And yet when he showed a dog, you never saw him. Never saw him. Unless, of course, he was trying to hide uh, Larry's boxer in front of him or something <laughs> like that. But um, it doesn't matter your physique. It doesn't matter if you've got timing and you've got good hands. Uh, you can show pretty much anything. That's great. Um, what advice do you have for upcoming handlers and judges? I can do both now. <laughs> I can yeah. ask you both. Yeah. Upcoming handlers, and, and this is important to me. This is very important. You have to become better businessmen. You have to provide yourself and your family with business insurance. 
And I can't tell you how many handlers out there don't carry insurance. They have to have workman's comp for the people that work for them. I can't tell you how many people don't carry workman's comp. They have to be able to save money and put money away. Uh, I remember Pauline Waterman saying to me one time, Woody, when you go to a dog show and you show 15 dogs, you know ahead of time that you have 15 handling fees. That's great, that's good. But you're gonna get some bonus money that weekend from group placements, best in show, whatever. Whatever the bonus money is, write yourself a check on Monday and slide that into an account that you never touch. Put money away every weekend. And you'd be surprised at the end of 10 years how much money you have. Because Will, I know, I know people, I know these two guys that showed chihuahuas and they had an old stretch limo and they took the seats out of it and they filled it with chihuahua crates and they went to the dog show like that when they died, they didn't have enough money to pay for the funeral or pay for a casket. And I, I'm afraid that you would be surprised how many handlers are like that. No, I know. Please be better businessmen and take care of the people working for you, provide them with insurance and, and workman's comp and pay them adequately. Pay them so that you recognize quality employees and you keep them. Um, for judges, advice for judges. The best advice that Ed Bibbon ever gave me, and I have to admit, is, as you can tell by listening to me, I, I tend to ramble on. Shut up. Shut <laughs> up. Don't talk. Don't, he said, what do you, I, you know, I almost don't want you to say good morning in the morning. Don't say anything. Don't give a reason why you did what you did. Just do it and go on. And I think that was like the best advice ever. And I remember that uh, this young man showed a border terrier to me one day and I ended up, I beat it in the breed and I made a comment about how I just wish it needed to be a better coat because I'm a fanatic on that. And uh, man, he lit into me and I said to myself, I have to take this because I opened yeah. the door. So I took it and then I said, when he was done, I said, okay, you, you were allowed to do that this time. Don't ever do that to me again. The other thing I want to tell you, and, and I'm full of stories. I remember years ago, and I'll tell you the judge, John Cole, he judged. We were in New Mexico and Ray Bay had this beautiful Sealyham called Mountain View Silver Bear in a totally blown shot embarrassing coat but it was a hell of a celium and i had the irish mcmichael in perfect coat he judged the group he put the sealy first and he put the irish second he came to me the next day to tell me how much he liked the irish he came to me and i said john if i can say something to you and he said yes i said you come from bull terriers you don't know about putting jackets on hard-coated terriers you did something yesterday that you should not have done. You rewarded a beautiful dog in horrific condition, and you beat a wonderful dog in perfect condition. Please, from now on, reward coat and condition. And do you know, Will, from then on, he did. And I'm not trying to give myself credit for that, but I think it's something as a bull terrier man with coats, he didn't really think about. Right. And so as judges, be aware of condition. Put your hands on them. Feel their weight. Feel their muscle tone. Feel their coat texture and the quality of their hair. Um, are they like a cavalier that's standing in front of you wagging their tail or are you down on your hands and knees with them? Do things that are subtle that are called for in the standards that only a true expert in those reads would know. Very good. I'm going to touch on one more thing, too, Wood. Do you remember that movie you were in? Uh, yes. <laughs> the, ah! the Black Marble. <laughs> I, I still have a copy of that the movie. Black, I 
I do. <laughs> I thought they were all destroyed. I, I'm shocked. <laughs> Some, somebody called me up, and I'll tell you who did it. Uh, Mike Doherty called me up and said, Wood, uh, I would like for you to appear in a movie. It'll be held at uh, the park where Pasadena, the, the dog show is held. And I need you to have a really good wire fox terrier in there. So, okay, I was showing a little dog called Mountaineer Tim Timothy. He was a best in show winner. And I had this dog and I trimmed him up and Will, he looked like a million bucks. So we went to the ring and he was in there along with about, I don't know, eight other wire fox terriers. And the actor, there was this old man and he was judging. He didn't have a clue what he was doing. And do you remember those two girls, those twins that did the spearmint gum commercial? <laughs> I, do, and I do. Each one had a bigger chest than the other one. <laughs> well, those girls came in the ring and that judge's head snapped over to those two girls and never looked at my dog or anybody else's and they went first and second. And then I was supposed to show my irritation at the fact that they weren't looking at my dog. And why he selected me to do that, I don't know. In, in the movie, your head snapped too. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want you to know, Will, I made 20 bucks off of that. <laughs> I got paid $20. <laughs> I loved it. There, there. Joseph <laughs> Wambaugh's Black Marble. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, the things yeah. that we do. Where did that movie come from? Who, who was that character supposed to be? The character in it was was fashioned after Rick. Was it? That's what. That's and what and the old gruff terrier man was fashioned after Rick, and that's where that came from. And I, I don't know, did Rick have a miniature schnauzer or something? I don't know. Adam, Which Rick. in itself would have been ironic because, and I can say this because Rick's no, no longer with us, he hated miniature <laughs> He hated them. He hated the fact that they were in the terrier group. He didn't think that they were terriers at all. And I'll tell you that in the beginning, Will, we stripped the cheeks on, on schnauzers. Oh my God. We clippered their throats and, no, we stripped their clippers and their rear ends and we stripped their furnishings. Holy. Right? <laughs> so we had a little dog called Landmark's Masterpiece. Nice little dog, but we did this while all those ladies in the beginning were coming in, clippering and scissoring and thinning cheering, and those things looked fantastic. And that little dog came in, um, he didn't look really pretty. <laughs> but that's the way Rick thought you had to do the schnauzers. Wow, wow. I'll tell you about Rick. And I always thought, because I would sit back and I would watch Rick at the shows and he was judging. And people would, would line up to talk to him and, and to show their dogs to him. And he always would say how, how beautiful they were. And, but I always knew if he was sitting there and he approached somebody or, or called them over, he really liked that dog. <laughs> like I, he, he would, he would be very like be positive with whoever, but I know if he was sitting there and I remember one time I was in the ring with my blue England setter bitch and he called me over and I knew at that point he liked her. Well, he wasn't just blowing smoke up. He, he liked her. So that, that's how I found watching Rick. I knew if, if I watched him and all of a sudden he zeroed in on something, I knew he liked it. I knew he honestly liked it. He wasn't just, just being nice to somebody. It was, it was interesting. It was interesting. Now, but Will, I'm going to tell you something. Remember I told you that passion. He, he was uh, passionate about certain things, and you would have been right up there at the top. And this is going to go back to what I said about you, that you didn't take shortcuts, that you presented them the old thing. He would have dogs, but he would have known the condition of him, and he would have admired you, and he would have admired George. And uh, people that came into his ring that uh, had been around the time, that right, um, he was very passionate about that. And this is another thing that I wish for judges today 
But unfortunately, unless they talk to people like myself or, or others, uh, some of these youngsters coming up that do a great job, like, uh, Adam, like Leonardo, like Jenny, if these judges could learn when an Airedale has been trimmed properly and that there's been no thinning shearing done on it, or the furnishings have not been scissored, or the gun have not been thin sheared, or, or things like that, they would not only be a better judge, they would be respected. And you know that stirs would that be that way. I would like to think that might be that way, and that they would know when a dog is prepared properly. Um, I wish there were more judges that understood proper presentation and rewarded it. And, and, and something else to, uh, to say to this. Um, I remember there was a dog that I judged last weekend, and it was a French Bulldog. I, I did a specialty show, and I didn't reward this dog. And the dog was very thin, and the coat was a bit moth-eaten. And it was shown by a young man that I have a great deal of respect for. And he had just gotten this dog, so uh, he wasn't able to put the dog in the condition that he normally would have shown it in. My, my message to him was, bring that dog back to me in six months in perfect weight, muscle tone, and condition. Because I really am somebody that spent 10 hours a day minimum conditioning and trimming dogs, and I need them to be in that kind of condition when they're shown to me in order to get a really great win. Right. One last question, Wood. If you could meet up with the 20 year old Wood, what advice would you give 20 year old Wood? To be kinder, to be more, um, I don't know if humble is the word, but more humble, to not offend people so much. I was one that if something was being done to me, I had to let the person know that I knew that it was being done to me, like a judge's decision mm -hmm. or whatever. And because of that, I made a lot of enemies. And I've had to work hard to overcome that. And I hope I am overcoming that. And I truly believe that since Barbara has come into my life, that I've become a nicer, softer, more gentlemanly person than I was when I was 20. And I always try to impart on Jenny, be the good guy. Don't be like me in the beginning. Accept your wins politely. Don't come back at the judge. Don't mouth off at judges. Uh, if you can do that and couple that with your talents and ability, you will conquer this, this incredible um, job of ours. Because, it, because Will, as you know, this is a job. Uh, I, I mean, I want you to tell me, if you put the same number of hours and the same effort into working as an executive for General Motors, as you did working being a dog handler, where would you be right now? How much money would you have in the bank? I hope you have a lot of money, but you know what? Think about that. This is a job and it's not an easy job. It's a hard job. The other thing that I want to say, sorry that I keep on rambling, but I want to say one more thing. To these young handlers that are coming up, and I think this is really important. I want you to draw a pie. And I want you to cut off a piece of that pie that you're committing to work. Now cut off a piece of the pie that you're committing to your wife or your husband or your partner. Now cut off a piece of that pie to what you're committing to your children. And now cut off a piece of that pie to what you've committed to yourself. And I want you to look at the disparity in those pieces of the pie.
And somehow or another, you've got to equate them. You've got to spend more time with your family, more time with your kids, and you've got to spend a little bit more time with yourself. Wise words, Wood. That was very nice. Thanks. And I applaud Barbara as well. <laughs> oh, every day of my life, I, I thank I, I thank my lucky star. She's in my life. Oh, good. Well, it's great to see you, Wood. I'm, I'm really happy you put this time aside for us. It was a great interview, and I'm sure many people are going to agree with me. So uh, I want to thank you again for doing this for us. And I hope to run into you somewhere soon. Well, this was an honor. And I have huge respect for the dog people in Canada. Um, and so I respect you as a dog man, but I respect you as a Canadian dog man who's been able to more than come down to the States and carry your own and succeed here. So many great Canadian dog people. Um, I've judged once up there. I hope I get more opportunities. I love the quality of the dogs. I love the dog people. Um, I'll tell you a person that I loved up there. I don't know if she's still alive, but I always respected Timmy Brazier's mother. Oh, yes. Joan Brazier, yes. She was a loved wonderful lady. Loved her. Yeah. yeah. But so many great Canadian dog people. But it was an honor that you asked me, and I hope I didn't let you down. Oh, you didn't let us down, Wood. That's for sure. I appreciate it. Give Barbara my best, and I hope to see you somewhere. You will. Thanks, Will. <laughs> Thanks, Will. You take care. Have a good night. All right. Thank you. I will. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Like I told you, he had a wealth of knowledge and story after story. It was captivating. I loved it, Wood. Thank you so much. If you like what you're seeing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. If you want to get a hold of me, go to dogshowtips at gmail.com. Or if you just want to find out what's happening in my world, go to willalexander.net. Thanks for tuning in, guys. See you next time.